Lukas Nussbaum will, the current Debian project leader, will deliver the bits from the Debian project leader now. Enjoy. Thank you. Does it work? Does it work? Does it work? Yeah, okay. Thank you. Okay, so to start, I wanted to start from what the sides of Debian that people encounter. And usually when people uh, meet Debian for the first time, it's, ab it's about the technical project. So we are a project building a very successful uh, distribution with a real impact of the world. That's really great because when you, you can go basically anywhere on earth and meet people using Debian or using Debian derivatives who know about Debian. And if you try to wear Debian t-shirts every day and you will see that many people recognize Debian. That's really, it's really cool. And in space too. Yeah, maybe, yeah, in space too, yeah, that's true. <laughs> but you're, it's harder to meet people in space. <laughs> But then there's also the um, philosophical and political project about promoting and defending free software. And what's really cool about Debian is that uh, we do that, but with reality check about uh, the technical parts. It's, it works like a feedback cycle between the technical part and the philosophical part. And uh, we are not doing uh, politics uh, in the blind. We are doing politics uh, we, while making sure that what we propose actually works. And then there's a social experiment with uh, thousands of volunteer contributors all over the world. And uh, well, DebConf is really, uh, well, building this community is a key outcome of DebConf. And I really think that this place is a fantastic place to have a successful DebConf that will help uh, build the Debian community. So I, I tried to find a, a symbol better than a, a group photo to uh, describes that international uh, community of contributors and I came up with power plugs because I think that really shows the diversity of Debian. <laughs> <laughs> so the question I guess uh, I get asked quite often as a project leader is uh, how is Debian doing and uh, I think that most of the project is working fine. I decided to single out one team because usually it's a team that gets a lot of blame. It's the uh, FTP masters team. And uh, actually, probably most of you know that uh, new processing uh, had some small issues during the last few weeks. But if you look at the, at the data, at the hard data, there are seven members of uh, FTP masters that were uh, doing new processing since the beginning of uh, July. <laughs> but I don't know if we probably that's, that might be one of the most active team in terms of active Debian developers. Seven like, looks like huge. The DebConf, team, the DebConf team might have more, but uh, still. And uh, since the beginning of August, they processed 284 packages in like an 11 days, versus only uh, 73 peop uh, uploads uh, in the queue, new uploads in the queue. Also, we released Widzy, finally. <laughs> uh, it's quite obvious that this cycle was a bit painful compared to the previous cycles. Uh, if you look at the length of the cycle, we are a bit uh, above the, uh, our recent uh, previous cycles, and the freeze was quite long. So we started the development of uh, Jesse with the usual bump of uh, RC bugs. Uh, and Jesse will be a quite challenging cycle. We, we, we really need to work uh, on returning to shorter freeze because long freeze are really not healthy for the project. And we have some difficult decisions to, to take. First, the one about um, init systems. Uh, and also, I think that uh, during this cycle, well, at the beginning of this cycle, there are many architectures where the status is not completely clean. Probably we need to, uh, to have a quite difficult discussions about some architectures. So I think that we should be really careful in um, doing, making these, those decisions uh, the Debian way, that is uh, make sure that we take the best technical decisions. But once the decision uh, will be taken, I think we really need to uh, stand behind that, de that, that decision as a project. And we should not um, let ourselves be, d be divided by the, the decision. So Debian is uh, almost 20 years old, 
but actually that's an age where most people stop growing, but Debian is still changing quite a lot. Uh, if you look at, well, if you went to sleep uh, in 2005 and uh, wake up now, probably the Debian project will look very different. I don't know if you know that movie about uh, uh, someone uh, getting into coma and then waking up after the Berlin Wall uh, was broken down, but it uh, could be fun to have uh, someone uh, waking up now after eight years. So uh, first, uh, team maintenance. Uh, most, well, majority of packages in Debian are maintained by teams now. Uh, since about uh, 2012, uh, so the red line is uh, packages maintained uh, by teams, uh, green line is uh, package not co-maintained, and the others are one co-maintainer, two co-maintainers, three co-maintainers, etc. So team maintenance is really the new way to maintain, to maintain stuff in Debian, but then we have a problem. Uh, we have uh, teams that get uh, MIA. We used to have uh, developers that go MIA, now we have teams that go MIA. And actually we are not quite good at, det as at uh, detecting that. When I did the survey about new contributors, one of them had a, had a nice story, well, not so nice actually. Uh, they created a, a team with only one DD to maintain a set of packages. And then the, the DD went MIA and the team was still active, but with no one to talk to to upload the packages. So it's kind of a lonely island in the middle of Debian. And we, we really suck at uh, detecting that currently. We need to work on that. Um, something else is uh, the use of uh, VCSs to that's related to teams actually to maintain packages in Debian. Uh, so the green line there is Git. Uh, the red line there is uh, no VCS. And the blue line is SVN. So Git is clearly taking over. Uh, all other solutions, well, DAX is increasing, I'm not sure if, why, well, <laughs> 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 probably some teams, are <laughs> ask a team maybe, uh, uh, but uh, Git is really the, the new standard to maintain packages, but uh, which way, well, we, we have several ways to maintain packages using Git, and each team tends to, tends to develop its own workflow uh, with, uh, with its own procedures, and that really sucks because as a project, we really need to uh, standardize on a single way to maintain packages and not have s um, the project divided into smaller projects with each its own way to maintain packages. So there's really some work to do uh, in that area about it would, be, uh, it would be fantastic if some teams use DebConf to come together and decide on a standard way to maintain Git uh, packages using Git. And then there's uh, also packaging helpers. Uh, so the, the blue line is DH. Uh, the red line is uh, pre-DH developer. And the green line is CDBS. So th that, that graph is, uh, I, I always find it quite funny because DH was originally advertised as a CDBS killer. And actually it's not really killing CDBS, more like killing a developer. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> well. <laughs> But still, uh, that raises a, a question. Uh, what do we do about uh, our former way to maintain packages? We are quite slow in general at deprecating uh, the previous uh, standard way to maintain packages. Clearly, DH is now the, the new standard, but well, packages are, are only slowly becoming uh, uh, migrated to DH. Oh, by the way, if you were wondering, uh, those kind of uh, staircase uh, steps there and there, those are the freeze. So you can see that uh, things slow, slow down during freeze and then start up again, which is expected. So Debian is almost uh, 20 years old. So first I thought that a clarification was needed. As, as computer geeks, it's in decimal. <laughs> and when you see that, you, ask, you can ask yourself uh, another question, which is, what should we do before reaching 20 uh, in X? Actually, I'm, I'm turning 20 in X uh, this year, so that's something I gave some thought. <laughs> or maybe, oops, uh, oh, okay. That's the problem with making last minute changes to presentations, uh, it's okay. Or maybe what should we do before, um, uh, well, during the next few years, what are the big challenges? Uh, so first, uh, 
If you look at the global picture around Debian, uh, we have upstream projects, we have users, and Debian is uh, in the middle. Uh, we get software from upstream projects and we turn them into packages that we distribute to users. And we get feedback and bugs and sometimes patches from users. And we forward them to uh, upstream projects. Or we try to, well, som we sometimes forward them to upstream projects, possibly with, pa ad with adding patches. But that's not the only thing. We also have Debian derivatives for which we have the same uh, schema. And some of them also have their own derivatives. <laughs> and so that's really uh, the picture of how it should be, uh, with Debian really at the center of the free software ecosystem. Uh, but some of, those, uh, um, some of those streams don't work so well in some cases. So one can ask whether we are always a good, a good downstream for our upstream and a good upstream for our derivatives. And I think there's room for improvement. In some cases, the uh, relationship we have with uh, downstreams or upstreams is really, is really good, but in some cases we, we can do better in that area and really uh, reinforce the position of Debian uh, in the center of the ecosystem. So there are simple things you can do. Uh, first, contact your upstreams. Uh, when you, s when you start maintaining something, it's really important that you talk to your upstream, if you have an, if you have an upstream. Um, so talk to, uh, talk to them, ask them to review your plans. If you plan to package a new upstream version, it's good to send them an email beforehand so that they can comment on uh, whether you should do that or just wait for the next release or something like that. Uh, provide them with feedback and bug reports. Um, we have uh, something that's not uh, very well known, which is patchtracker.debian.org that extracts, that extracts uh, patches from Debian packages so that upstream can easily um, integrate them. Uh, ask them to subscribe to the packages on the PTS. So there are a few, there are, I know of a few packages, for example, Core Utils, where the upstream maintainers uh, are actually replying to bugs uh, in, the bug in the Debian bug tracking system. And that's just great because users report bugs in Debian, the upstream maintainer comments on the bug directly in the BTS. It's a perfect way to work. N not all upstreams want to work that way, but when, <coughs> they, when they agree to work that way, it's just fantastic. Uh, look at your downstreams, uh, at our downstreams, uh, bugs and patches. Uh, and there's a, there's a panel tomorrow at DevConf about uh, derivatives. Would be a good idea if we had a large audience attending. But more generally, I think that we need to uh, keep in mind that Debian is also about improving free software as a whole, and we should not work, well, we should work on improving Debian, but uh, we should really get the, keep the global picture of improving, the improving free software and improving the, the world generally. And for that, we need to be a good player and collaborate with all entities. So then the uh, ecosystem around, er around us is changing. Uh, everybody is talking about cloud, which is a nice buzzword, but not only a buzzword. Um, and it brings uh, virtualization elasticity of infrastructure and software. And our model where uh, we, you, you install a system once and then you upgrade it for 10 years uh, uh, using several Debian releases, it becomes less relevant with that ecosystem because you just start up a new virtual machine. Uh, you don't need, to, you don't need to upgrade Debian that often anymore. And we have, that raises many challenges for Debian. First, uh, the cloud, uh, as, pointed, as pointed by many people, is taking freedom away from users. So we need to uh, work towards uh, preserving that freedom and we have several ways to, to do that. For example, uh, we can package um, uh, uh, software so that user can deploy their, their own private cloud. So we are doing that. Uh, there's some margin for imp improvements there. It's, those are really, really hard uh, software stacks. Uh, with many, well, usually split in many different packages with custom configuration of services. And uh, well, more manpower on that part would be really nice. Then uh, we 
uh, also should work on packaging uh, pass tax and uh, SaaS tax. And standardizing uh, platform, well, development platform, deployment platform, uh, and adding those standard platform in Debian uh, is really important. So for SaaS, actually we run into the usual problem of uh, web applications packaging. That's not something we are particularly uh, strong at, uh, and it's increasingly imp important. But then on, on a more technical level, uh, the world is using uh, Puppet and Chef everywhere, or is trying to use Puppet, and Puppet or Chef everywhere. And one can wonder what's the role of, package of Debian packages, package managers, and of uh, configuration using DebConf in that world. And we might need to evaluate what we do and maybe adapt a bit so that we uh, can better integrate with uh, those tools. And for uh, public clouds, there's also the question of uh, official Debian uh, images. What does it mean to provide uh, Debian on, uh, on a public cloud such as uh, uh, Google's or, or Amazon's uh, uh, clouds? <coughs> so if you look at, the, at uh, this year's uh, DebConf schedule, there are eight uh, cloud-rated sessions uh, at DebConf. And uh, I hope that, well, we can address, well, work on all those uh, topics. <laughs> so, <laughs> probably some things that uh, will raise some discussions. Uh, I think we should uh, look into meeting uh, all our users' needs. Uh, so we, we have Debian testing, which is the first and the best uh, rolling distribution. And, uh, I think we should really uh, acknowledge that and advertise uh, testing as such, as a, as a rolling distribution. So testing is already widely used. Uh, during the last few days, I made some stats from uh, uh, Debian uh, Mirror. And actually, if you look at uh, the uh, HTTP logs from uh, that Mirror, you see that, uh, uh, so what I did was uh, take the log, uh, grab for people um, uh, fetching the packages file, and then look at which IP fetches which packages file. And 42% um, of uh, uh, the, uh, the users of that mirror fetched the squeeze uh, packages file, 60% the WYSI one, 12% uh, the testing one, and 11% the unstable one. So it's not, well, clearly uh, there are more users, well, there's two possibilities. Either we have very few users and many developers, or we have uh, quite a lot of users using uh, testing uh, and, and or unstable. If you look at the popularity contest submitter, so this doesn't add up to 100 because uh, one specific IP can fetch several packages file. Um, if you look at popularity contest submitters, so looking at the version of the popularity contest package that is used to submit the results, uh, we have about 10% of people using testing or unstable. So, and actually that share, so that's the blue share there, it varies quite a lot during cycles and uh, at the end of the with this cycle, just before the release, it was a lot more people using uh, testing <laughs> or unstable. So, that's not something new. We have people, lots of people using testing and unstable. But there are also many uh, other good reasons to go into the direction of a rolling release. Uh, first, it makes uh, us provide more recent software to users. So for the free software community in general, it means that uh, we build a shorter feedback, lo feedback loop between upstream projects and uh, the user. User can, re can use recent software, report bug on, rec on recent software, because usually when you are an upstream developer, you don't really care about uh, bugs in software you developed two years ago. Uh, probably the bug was found in the meantime. And uh, the more people we have using uh, recent software, uh, the more bugs are fixed and the more in general free software is improved. Uh, it, may, it gets us more testers of the next table release. Uh, so uh, usually what happens, uh, well, uh, it's quite useful from a uh, release management point of view to detect bugs earlier. It gives us mo more time to fix bugs. Um, and actually, we, 
if you look at uh, Christian's stats about, I think it was Christian who made the stats, about bug reporting rate, uh, the, the Ubuntu bug reporting rate is, is much higher than Debian, which is a bit worrying. Of course, if you are the, um, I don't know, uh, Ice Weasel maintainer, you don't really care about receiving more bugs. Probably you have enough and it's pretty well, uh, it's pretty well covered. Uh, but if you maintain a quite obscure Ruby library, uh, it could help to have two times more users because uh, probably uh, if you have only 100 users worldwide, not all of them will report bugs and uh, it could be uh, helpful to increase that number of users. Something else that it makes uh, us uh, attract different users. So um, if you look at uh, people using uh, Arc Linux, for example, most of them are quite young, enthusiastic uh, Linux users. And attracting uh, more of this kind of users to Debian means that uh, in the end, uh, some of them uh, will turn into uh, con Debian contributors. And uh, having the image of the old and boring distribution, which is not completely true, but uh, uh, some, of, some of it, doesn't really help us recruit new people. It's better to be, well, we can, we can stay with the uh, old and boring uh, aspect, but it's better to have the, the other side of uh, being uh, young and uh, really active. And also, I think that actually it's a uh, low hanging fruit because there's no need to change uh, anything. Uh, it's mainly about uh, PR, about uh, communication, communicating to the public that uh, testing is uh, usable as a rolling distribution and um, uh, well, just use it and stuff like that. Uh, so uh, I think everything is there, just, uh, just need to, to, to advertise it. Of course, the big challenge uh, with that is to coexist with the stable release and to not arm the stable release. We really need to work on, uh, well, we, don't, we, don't, we should be really careful about not decreasing the the quality and the, and the workforce that goes into our stable release. So ab about manpower, uh, the challenge for the next uh, few years, of as usual, is to, as it was for the, next for the, for the past uh, 20 years probably, is to recruit new contributors. So everybody complains about uh, manpower. This is a regular complaint, and I think it's a justified complaint. There are many areas in Debian where we could use a lot more manpower. Uh, as a DPL, I often have to uh, poke people about uh, why, is, why is something uh, not working as expected. And, uh, well, of course, it's easy to, to blame the lack of manpower, but uh, sometimes uh, when you don't have, when the well, sometimes it just boils down to that and you can't do anything besides that. So. Uh, I made a survey of uh, new contributors. You might have read uh, uh, the report on Debian project last week. Uh, what it shows is that it's really hard to contribute to Debian. Uh, as a project, we tend to build um, very efficient uh, processes and tools. So we like to, be, to optimize stuff for ourselves. But as a result, uh, those processes are and tools are often quite complex and difficult to learn for newcomers. And well, that's, uh, that's a trade-off. Well, we tend to be selfish about uh, our processes and tools and, uh, well, it's hard to change, but uh, keeping that in mind when uh, designing processes and tools would be still already be a good thing. Um, we have very high quality requirements. Uh, the attention to detail we put into our packages it just, it's just incredible. Of course, that's something that uh, contributes greatly to the success of Debian. But still, for new contributors, it might be a bit uh, surprising. Um, we have a misalignment between uh, our contributors' uh, goals and our goals. What we want, really, is people who just join our teams and fix uh, all the team's bugs and upgrade our packages to the new version. That would be fantastic. Problem is, people come with uh, an idea of what they want to do inside Debian, and usually it's uh, package this thing I use that, well, maybe nobody else uses, but uh, that's something that is important to, to the new contributor. And, uh, well, 
we need to find a middle ground between uh, what, um, what the new contributor wants and what we want. And uh, also, uh, one sh thing that the survey showed that it's very hard to get sponsored out outside of team. So if you want to package something and there's a team uh, where, it, where it fits, it's fine. You will f probably find uh, someone willing to, to sponsor uh, your software. If it doesn't fit in a team and you don't know, you don't have a friend or colleague who is a Debian developer and who will do the sponsoring for you, then uh, it's really, really hard. So you can all help change that. And I think it's a really collective responsi responsibility to uh, change that. Uh, first, uh, subscribe to Debian Mentors and do some sponsoring uh, on Debian Mentors. If all of us do one, sp uh, one, spons one sponsor on Debian Mentors per month, I think the problem is solved, basically. Problem is, uh, if you look at the Debian Mentors archives, last month, I think there was like four or five different DDs doing uh, <laughs> reviews and sponsoring. So we cannot point to something where only four or five different DDs are, are, are active. And something that is, um, uh, well, deep in the culture of Debian is that uh, you cannot make mistakes. And what's, uh, you're not allowed to make mistakes. And I think that for sponsoring, that's really hard because you, you are asked to review something and you cannot read uh, all the upstream code or you cannot audit all the upstream code looking for, for possible bugs. And at some point, uh, you need to take the risk to make the upload. And sometimes uh, it's true that uh, mistakes will happen. And I think we need to, to be better at accepting mistakes. Mm. It's okay to not know everything. It's okay to... Um, it's okay to not, uh, not be perfect right from the start, but uh, it's better to, to be vocal about things you don't know and things where you are unsure than to just hide it under the carpet and hope that nobody will notice. And actually, even reviewing packages is something quite hard because you, well, if you miss something, everybody will see it. And, but I think that's okay. That uh, we should really increase the culture of uh, this being okay. One of the, uh, someone mentioned that one of the people doing sp uh, reviews on Debian Mentors, there's a lot of reviews, but never sponsors. So I'm not sure if it's because uh, they fear that they are going to make a mistake by, by uploading something that, uh, by, missing, uh, by, by missing something by reviews. But that's, uh, that's really sad. I mean, we need to, it's okay if you make mistakes from time to time. It's software, you can probably revert it uh, somehow. It's really hard to, it's really hard to break uh, Debian badly by uh, sponsoring something. Um, so there's some work to do uh, on infrastructure around some sponsoring. Uh, mentors at Debian.net uh, got rewritten two years ago, I think. Well, the current version uh, got um, the work started two years ago using a summer of code project, I think. Uh, and it's, it really helps, but uh, there's more to do. For example, um, in many cases, uh, the review is just, oh, you forgot that Lintian error. Uh, if we had uh, automated Lintian checks of uh, packages uploaded to mentors, probably the user, the prospective contributor will notice and uh, there's, uh, well, this, uh, this limits uh, the need for reviews. So I think that, uh, well, Ni Nicolas Dandrimont mentioned that uh, work is underway there. I don't know who is, I think it's Paul Tagliamonte who is working on that. Yeah. <laughs> um, so something else is related to the uh, misalignment between contributors' goals and uh, our goals. Uh, we need to be better at advertising tasks that are suitable for new contributors. So if we don't want uh, new contributors to package the, uh, an well, another image viewer, uh, we need to provide them with ideas of things they could do. So we have WNPP alert. Uh, who, runs, who in the room is running WNPP alert on a regular basis? One person. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> So we need a way to, to make it easier to discover opportunities of contributions. There are lots of opportunities for contributions, actually. If, if you run WLPP alert, you probably find two or three packages that you rely on that are orphaned. And 
if you find someone uh, to adopt it, I mean, uh, it, solves, it solves your problem for, for those packages. Um, we need to uh, design better and simpler processes and tools and document them. Uh, but there are some, for example, everything, everything related to uh, uh, using alias, using Git, using uh, SVN to maintain packages. This is quite poorly documented currently. Um, so something that really, really, uh, as was mentioned, that something uh, really useful is uh, everything related to peer mentoring and internship projects. Uh, new contributors really like the human contact of having someone to ask questions to. Uh, that's something that uh, I don't know exactly uh, how we can improve that yet, but that's something. Well, uh, Andrea still has some ideas. There's a session about uh, about that, about, about peer, men peer mentoring. Uh, but uh, yeah, we need to we need to work on that. But well, in general, basically, what we need to do is uh, help Debian become a more welcoming project where people get can con start contributing more easily because currently it's really, really hard. So if you look at the schedule, there are seven events related to that. So the good news is that um, people care about this. Uh, we just need to make progress in on that. And then uh, uh, before I conclude my talk, I want to talk a bit about um, uh, Debian governance. So I just learned a new job. Um, and my vision of uh, the new job is that uh, many DPL tasks are quite short tasks where if you do them in, uh, with using low latency as a, like uh, you, well, as soon as you receive it, uh, it's done, it's much better. So for example, everything related to uh, money handling, email redirection to the right people, um, poking people about something, everything related to legal, there are some constraints about uh, all it you take to answer and all those tasks are quite hard to delegate or to share because there's a hard coordination uh, overhead if you want to share them with a the team it doesn't really work because we'll spend a lot of time uh, coordinating with the rest of the team and it doesn't really make sense so you can do it uh, yourself but there are also lots of times uh, tasks that can be delegated either totally or partially even uh, writing a, a delegation for example um, that's something that takes some time uh, because you need to contact the team, uh, figure out uh, who uh, they would like to, to see added to the team. Then you wait two weeks because it's nobody noticed your mail and ping them again. That, that's quite time consuming. And actually, there's only the final act of sending the delegation email that can only uh, be done by the DPL currently. Everything else can be prepared by someone else, and that would be kind of that kind of things would be really useful. So uh, Zach started the DPL Helpers Initiative um, in order to try to distribute uh, those tasks to to a team and to teach uh, more people uh, what DPL tasks are about. Um, so I, I well my my view for that is that. Uh, it could be a kind of government for the Debian project. That is, you have someone that is uh, uh, mainly responsible in doing uh, that kind of short tasks, but then you have a group of people, uh, um, each with their own area of interest, uh, doing specific things. For example, we could have some someone uh, specializing in all uh, uh, legal stuff, in all uh, new contributors related stuff, and those are areas that quite easy to define and quite easy to delegate. I mean, delegate in the informal sense of uh, the way. This doesn't really need to be an, uh, something official for most of the tasks. So the problem with DPL helpers is that it's not very active. We had only two participants at the last meeting. So <laughs> I feel a bit trapped as a DPL because <laughs> I was hoping to rely on this to, <laughs> to, share, to share the load and <laughs> actually, um, there's not that many people willing to share the load with me. <laughs> uh, but uh, I wonder whether, whether this could be the basis for a more su sustainable governance model for Debian, something that could, w could work uh, and that would allow someone not from French academia or not self-employed to be the DPL, because uh, <laughs> we're running out of, uh, <laughs> French, of people from French academia. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so there's a, there's a both about that. It's, it's not, well, it, we might mention uh, 
current, well, things are going on currently and uh, active tasks. But I also would like to spend a lot of time discussing, uh, discussing this and how we can move forward and uh, make it possible to, to move away for, from, uh, from French uh, academia. <laughs> okay, so uh, that, uh, the end, that's the end of my talk. Um, so thank you for coming to DevConf. Uh, enjoy DevConf. I hope it will be a very successful uh, DevConf. I'm quite sure it will be. Uh, please use DevConf to come and talk to me uh, in person. So that's my in, uh, the leader email, which is uh, uh, archived and my IRC nickname if you want to uh, ping me and then we can meet <laughs> somewhere. So that's a kind of reminder of what I talked about in my, uh, uh, in my talk so that you don't need to ask questions about only the last points or only about trolling. Thank you. <laughs> About the rolling distribution thing, the testing as rolling distribution, I see a potential problem that has already been discussed and I already raised it in, in, in IRCs. Uh, when, when the freeze comes, mm -hmm. would it be, the, the, this uh, rolling distribution, would, would it be freezed? I mean, would it be intermittently rolling? Would it be handled differently or there might be two overlapping testing distributions at a time or how, how might that be handled? Well, I think that... Uh, well, with that freeze duration, it's probably a big problem. Uh, well, with that freeze duration, I think that we can live with uh, everything being frozen for three months, four, almost four months. Um, so I think that everybody wants shorter freeze. Uh, that would be useful for rolling, uh, for rolling distribution. So uh, let's just aim for shorter freeze and not, let's not try to do something more complex that might hurt stable releases. At least for now, maybe in, in, uh, in five years, five years from now, we'll figure out something and uh, to so that, that makes everybody happy. But uh, what we do currently, I think, he, uh, is fine. I, I don't think three months is an acceptable freeze interval. I really don't. I mean, we've had this conversation at the last several dev comps, and I think a really good target duration for a freeze is two or three weeks. If, yeah. we, can't, hmm. if we can't run a process that allows us to return unstable to being unstable in much less than a month, then I, I think it, it's it really negatively impacts the ability of lots of things in the project to keep rolling. Those stair steps that show up in many of our plots are just, you know, un very frustrating. Yeah, but it also depends on uh, what you call freeze, actually. Of uh, your definition, well, our definition of freeze is, we have our, our definition of freeze. If we change the definition of freeze, we can have shorter freeze, shorter of total freeze, for example. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean... <laughs> But there are things to explore in that area, uh, like um, making sure that uh, key packages don't get uh, upgraded to new upstream versions just before the freeze. That's a bit... Um yes, yes, obviously this is all part of what it takes to, to make something like that happen. Mm -hmm. I'm certainly not advocating a return to the very, very old process of let's just grab a snapshot of unstable on a particular day and call it a release. But <laughs> there has to be something in between because when we end up in a situation where for many, many months we're not changing you know, tool chains and core libraries and so forth, it's very, very easy for people to, to lose focus know for their attention to move elsewhere and then I think it's very hard for us to get it back. Um, I clearly remember the talk of Anthony Towns in 2001 at his uh, first uh, DevConf when he uh, introduced the um, uh, pool system wh where testing was introduced and uh, somebody else and me raised immediately their hand what will happen with packages who uh, are in testing and have a release critical bug will they removed again? And the decision, decision was no, but I think there is some tendency now to remove these packages, at least leave packages, which have cr uh, release critical bugs, and I think this is quite a good thing. Hmm. Yeah, uh, I think that we, sh we should go further in that direction. That is, 
uh, well, which we tend to treat all packages uh, as equal, which is nice because our users rely on all of our packages. But some of them are still more important than others. And uh, if we if we had a, a way to easily um, detect which are the bugs that really need to be fixed before the before the release, and which are the ones that well, we could just remove the package if it doesn't work. And okay, some users will suffer, of course, but um, it doesn't block the release. Um, it would be a good way. But maybe we should we should just go further than uh, removing packages during the freeze, but also remove packages now. I mean, if something is clearly unsuitable for the next release, we could just remove it from testing now, and if it gets fixed, it can get back. We have at least, uh, well, almost two years to to get back in testing, so get, 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 it, get it back in shape. So <coughs> but, well, no, but almost, well, we, we have very few release team uh, members present at DevConf, which is a bit... Uh, uh, so it is a bit difficult to discuss that, and that's their main uh, responsibility to decide that. Of course, I need to talk of with the project, but uh, it's their role to, to decide about that. So, Luca, uh, you, you make two proposals. Mm -hmm. One is to make testing more a rolling release, and the other is to remove more things from it. How do yeah. you reconcile those two? <laughs> I'm quite sure we can find uh, technical solutions to that, and there are already technical solutions such that people just install packages from unstable from time to time. And for the users that we are targeting anyway, it's not really a problem if from time to time they need to uh, take specific... Actually, it's, it's if the package is not in testing and you have unstable in your source dot list, it just works. But I don't think our main problem are leave packages, are there? Are they? I mean, you can always say, like, if there's a bug in a library, then let's remove it. So if there's a bug in libruby, let's remove Ruby and all its packages. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, leave packages are not our problem. Um, to remove leave packages is easy, and we yeah. do that. Hmm. Question is, what if there's a bug in Ice Weasel? Yeah, but I think bugs in Ruby, but maybe I'm a bit uh, biased about that. But uh, Antonio can, can eat you if <laughs> it's just next to you. <laughs> but um, uh, I think bugs in Ruby are probably the kind of bugs that should be fixed. Because, well, uh, Debian really is, well, we, we need to draw the line somewhere, yeah. of course. But uh, Ruby is probably on the let's fix it uh, side of the line. Uh, I'm not sure that, uh, I don't know, well, some obscure uh, Ruby library like uh, Ruby Fit Fit Pastor, I'm the upstream for that. Nobody cares if it's getting removed. Okay, well, some people will care, but. <laughs> so I'd like to propose a radical answer to that um, question, which is that we should be prepared to revert something like Ruby to the previous upstream version if it fixes mm. release critical regressions. Um, and Obviously, that should be done with some care, but it, it might need to be done as an NMU. So we need to develop some collective understanding of when that might be appropriate and how to manage the fallout. Mm. But if we're able to do that, then we'll be in a much better position to fix bugs that are somehow intractable just by undoing the problematic mm. upload effectively. But I think this is already happening, kind of. For uh, during the freeze, sometimes it happens that we just revert something to the previous version because the new version introduced problems. Often it's because the maintainer decided to update uh, and it was not really a good idea, but uh, uh, we already have that possibility and use it from time to time. I'm not sure it really helps uh, fixing, it would help fix that many additional bugs to develop that better. One thing that is uh, related is the kind of um, Having a feature branch for packages and having a, a way to uh, to revert specific uh, changes. To be well, currently we only have one development branch. We could have feature branch where uh, every package, uh, every new uh, version of package of a package uh, lives or sets of packages live and get the, uh, have them merge into unstable or testing into something like that. But uh, well, that's a lot of uh, technical development. 
Yeah, okay. I think time is over. So if you want to discuss this further, you have to use the hallway track. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you.